Are you looking for inspiring conversations about faith, film, and life? You're in the right place. Here's the host who knows the right questions to ask, Father Edward Looney. Hey, everybody. It's Father Edward Looney here. And today on the podcast, roles have been reversed. No, I'm not the guest and someone's interviewing me on my podcast. But what I mean by that is that I've been interviewed before by Father Mitch Pacwa, who has a show on EWTN. Maybe many of you have seen EWTN live. And so uh, I know this is kind of intimidating for me a little bit just because he's kind of the expert Catholic communicator and uh, someone that I've looked to uh, in this sector and in this realm uh, for uh, inspiration and with admiration. So back in 2020, uh, before the pandemic shut down the world, uh, I was a guest to discuss my book, A Lenten Journey with Mother Mary on EWTN Live. I uh, was able to have some of the wild game that Father Mitch has uh, has harvested. And then also uh, we took in a film too at your house, uh, Father Mitch. So uh, today we're, I'm speaking with you about your new book. Uh, it's a commentary on the book of Isaiah, an in-depth look at the gospel of the Old Testament. And I think this is going to be a very enriching conversation because Father Mitch, you are very knowledgeable and uh, and there's so much that you can teach us. I know just from this book and from this conversation we're going to have. So thanks so much for taking time out of your day to to converse with me today. My pleasure. My pleasure. And don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, good. I, I'll try not to be. So, um, you know, uh, I, I love the fact that you call it the gospel of the Old Testament. And, mm-hmm. you know, maybe my prophets class was a bit lacking. I don't know, in the seminary. Uh, I remember my prophets class, we had a text uh, from Abraham Heschel, who was uh, a a Jewish Mm -hmm. rabbi, I think, uh, called The Prophets. And so that was one of our main texts. And um, to be honest, I don't remember much about my prophets class, except that I had one. But uh, maybe just as uh, we get started here, this is a commentary on the book of Isaiah. We know he's a prophet. He has a book in the Bible. Why is he important? And why were you fascinated with Isaiah? Yeah, well, first... Uh, I've been studying Isaiah since I was in graduate school. He's a a, a crucial figure uh, in the history of Israel and the prophets. Uh, But I actually wrote this commentary because uh, a lay group known as the Catholic Scripture Study uh, asked me to write this for their courses. So it was more their interest um, and, you know, my, my background, they got me to do it. And I, I was happy to do it. The um, Isaiah comes uh, at, at a crucial times in the history of Israel. And so that's one reason we study him, just to understand ancient Israel. But also, as you know well, Father, in Advent and Lent, Readings from the prophet Isaiah are very common when we read the liturgy of the hours during Advent and Christmas time. We go through the book of Isaiah, uh, not only in the Roman Rite, but also in the Eastern Church. I, I pray the Maronite liturgy of the hours, and uh, we go through the whole book. And we also see many readings during Mass, during Advent, as well as in Lent that come from Isaiah. And that's one of the reasons I called this the uh, Gospel of the Old Testament. It's not my title. St. Jerome used yeah. that phrase. Uh, he wrote uh, a commentary Uh, and and more of an introduction to Isaiah in his translation. He famously translated the the Bible into Latin. He had studied a lot of Greek. He was a fantastic Latinist. That's what he studied in Rome, was Latin literature, became a great Latinist. And he knew well that the existing Latin translations were not very good at all. They're awful. So he corrected and improved them. But he also 
learned Hebrew uh, because he had lived a fairly bad life as a student. He liked drinking and going to where the dancing girls were and lingering. And so he uh, eventually re repented and converted at age 18 or 19. But as he said, I couldn't get the dancing girls of Rome out of my mind and memory. So he decided every time he would experience temptations to lust, he would study Hebrew. Hmm. He became the greatest Hebrew scholar of the first 1500 years of the church. <clears throat> I've often <clears throat> suggested to my students that if they would use that same principle in their dormitories, they could probably solve global warming, world <laughs> hunger, the energy crisis, world peace, and cure cancer, and who knows what else. But not all of them have taken me up on that. However, St. Jerome learned Hebrew extraordinarily well uh, and to counteract his temptations. And uh, he also, not only did he call Isaiah in his uh, again, prologue to the book, the Gospel of the Old Testament, he's, that's where he also wrote, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. And uh, a very famous line. And the issue is this, Isaiah prophesied so many of the key events of salvation that Jesus our Lord won for us. Uh, Again, I, I always like to point out Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 proclaims that a virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Mm. Should sound familiar. And even in uh, Isaiah chapter 1, right at the beginning of the book, after the, the uh, opening uh, identification of Isaiah, says, an ox knows, uh, and an ass both know the, their master's manger. But my people do not know me. Because of that line, St. Francis of Assisi included an ox and an ass in the original scene of, of the nativity, the first the nativity crash. He put them live ones into the little cave in Italy when he came up with the first one uh, because of that verse. And then we can take a look, say, at um, our Lord speaking to St. Peter and saying to him, you are rocking on this rock. I will build my church in Matthew 16, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You can only really understand that by going back to Isaiah 22, when there is a change of prime minister and the king of Judah took a key and placed it on the shoulder of the new prime minister. Giving of the keys was a symbol of becoming a prime minister. So St. Peter is appointed by Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as the one with the keys for the gates of heaven, the king's home. And that is the way to indicate he's the prime minister in the kingdom of God. Christ is the king. These and many other parts of Isaiah look forward to Jesus our Lord. Uh, even in, uh, for instance, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, there's that line. A shoot will spring forth from the stump of Jesse. Jesse being King David's father. And what Isaiah predicted is that the family of David would be cut off at a stump. Be, the, the family tree would be cut down. But a new shoot 
would come out of it, referring to Jesus, who will replace the Davidic line. He's from the Davidic line, like the shoot comes from the olive stump, but he'll replace him. And what's key about that is the word for shoot in Hebrew is netzer. Netzer is the root of the name of Jesus' hometown, Nazareth. It was named after that verse. Oh, wow. And when it says that, you know, a lot of people were perplexed. In the Gospel of John, it said he will be called a Nazarene. And people were saying, where was that? Well, you have to know Hebrew. And it's he will be called the shoot person, the person who is the shoot. And it goes back to that verse. That same verse also goes on to say that this, the, the Lord will put the spirit of God upon him, a spirit of wisdom and knowledge and understanding and counsel and fear the Lord and piety. That comes from that same verse. And so many other things that we know about Christ, our understanding of him comes from there. Calling him Wonder Counselor, Prince of Peace. That comes from Isaiah chapter 8 and 9. So over and over again, our liturgy and our readings about Christ come from the prophet Isaiah. And that's why St. Jerome called this book the Gospel of the Old Testament. It summarizes the key elements of the Gospel. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, even the gifts of the Holy Spirit that people yeah. receive through the gift of the Holy Spirit at confirmation come to us, are named, enumerated in the book of the prophet Isaiah. So it is a very yeah. rich text, as you just mentioned, has all of these different uh, allusions and such that we take uh, into what we believe uh, even today. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty mm -hmm. incredible, all the things you just shared there. And yeah, of course, you mentioned Advent, and we uh, know that phrase, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. And so I'm a Marian theologian at present, the president of the Mariological Society of America. And cool. so, of course, I take... I take great interest in, uh, you know, that that verse. But in my study of some, you know, kind of low Mariologists, if we'd like to call that uh, in terms of biblical scholarship, you know, a lot of them would like to poo poo the idea of this actually being read with Mary being the person. They try to explain it away. And, well, this is who yeah. Isaiah actually really had in mind and what he was prophesying. And so they want to be very dismissive of Mary and the Marian reading of this, you know, we see it too, uh, some biblical scholars, I'll name one in particular, like Raymond Brown, for example, very dismissive of this, but also of Revelation 12, of seeing Mary as a referent uh, of Revelation 12. So what, what do you make of that, I guess? How do you respond to maybe some of the people that want to take Isaiah and say, no, no, this is not uh, this is not the perfect Advent text. You know, you are using it uh, in a way that Isaiah didn't intend. <laughs> well, you can see I'm sort of chuckling because I've heard all this too. And the reason they say that is that the word used in the passage in Isaiah, the Hebrew word is alma, alma. And they say in uh, there's one verse where it refers to a young woman um, in more in general than to specifically a virgin. And that uh, and that's true. But there are two things. One, in their culture, they expected that a young woman would be a virgin until she was married. That was kind of the that was the task of fathers and brothers to protect their sister's honor. So that was one thing. But more importantly, as you know, Father, the Bible is the first religious 
book ever to be translated from one language into another in its entirety. First time. And it was translated from Hebrew into Greek beginning around 250 BC under uh, Ptolemy the third, I think it was. Um, he wanted a copy of the Bible in Greek at the great library at Alexandria. So he find, financed this uh, translation. They only translated the first five books, but over the next hundred years, they finished translating the other books as well. And what's interesting is that when they translated that book from Hebrew into Greek, they translated Alma, they used the specific Greek word Parthenon to, re, to be the translation. That means virgin as, as in the strictest sense. Secondly, in the first century, the Old Testament was also translated into Aramaic. This is a, a translation known as the Targum. When they translated that verse, they translated the word Alma as Batula. Batula is the specific Aramaic word meaning virgin. So that Jewish readers, uh, anywhere from uh, one to two centuries, before Christ, clearly understood Alma to refer to a virgin. This is not a late Christian rereading back. It was Jewish readers, Jewish translators, who knew that the word Alma meant virgin. That was that. That's a fact. In fact. In the uh, Oriental liturgy, uh, you know, like the Aramaic-speaking liturgy and in many of the Arabic hymns, we still refer to the Blessed Mother as Batula. You know, um, you know, right before the consecration, you know, we we talk about Jesus as the uh, God's only Son who is. Uh, it became flesh in uh, by the Virgin Mary, and we use the word batula uh, in Arabic, and you know it just means virgin, plain and simple. So the people at the time of Christ and earlier understood this to be a virgin, and uh, it seems pretty clear to me that the archangel Gabriel who spoke that verse to St. Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, clearly understood that Mary was a virgin. Now, there are scholars that you mentioned who don't want this to refer to the Blessed Virgin Mary, but the angel sent by God certainly did. <laughs> And that's why he quoted it to St. Joseph. So um, at this point, some of those same scholars have now gone to the Lord. And maybe they and St. Gabriel the Archangel can have a little discussion about how to interpret that. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so. You know, some things that we don't understand in this life, we will understand, of course, in eternity when all is revealed to us. And uh, yeah, so that's an appropriate Advent verse. Uh, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Now, we're in the season of Lent right now. The angel this... Gabriel thought so, too. <laughs> so we're in the season of Lent. And uh, and so in Isaiah, there's all of these references to what's called the suffering servant. And there, there's mm -hmm. a handful of different prophecies about the suffering servant and so just as we have this virgin who shall conceive and bear a son and be named Emmanuel and that Emmanuel, Jesus, now he also is seen as the suffering servant. So 
what could you do or what could you say to give us a crash course in what we should know about the suffering servant that we'll hear about, especially during Holy Week? There are four of these, what we call the songs of the, the servant, the servant songs, four of them. The first one is in Isaiah 42. That one is referenced as belonging to Christ all the way back to Matthew chapter 11, when Matthew cites it saying, he will not shout or raise his voice. He will not break the bruised reed or snuff the smoldering wick, referring to the gentleness with which Jesus acted. But he's also called the servant who will bring righteousness. That's the, that passage, and there's no suffering particularly in that passage. The second servant song is Isaiah 49, and there the um, the servant seems to be of, of two sides. It seems to be Israel. Uh, you are my servant, Israel. But then it switches to somebody else who is the messenger to Israel. And it brings them the word of God, and he brings it like a sword or an arrow. A sword is for close combat, and an arrow is for distant but the combat. But in both cases, they, the tips pierce a person. And the idea is that the word of the servant will pierce into the heart. The third servant song in Isaiah 51, that begins to describe the suffering. They have plucked my beard and they have uh, hit my cheek, bruised my cheek. And I don't think the soldier who hit Jesus on the face intended to help fulfill that prophecy, but he did. And, and also on the Shroud of Turin, evidence of the, a cheek being wounded is present. And then the fourth of those servant songs is Isaiah 53. And this is truly the song of the suffering servant par excellence. It's much more expanded than in Isaiah 51. And it describes, in him there is nothing beautiful to look at, nothing comely to look at. Uh, and he was rejected by men. But he has borne our iniquities. And by his wounds we are healed. And he will be counted among the wicked. Once again, the Roman soldiers who crucified Jesus in between two criminals did not say, hey, I heard about some prophecy in Isaiah. Let's help them fulfill it. The Roman soldiers had no clue about the words of Isaiah. And they had no interest in helping fulfill a prophecy about the Messiah. They just put one thief on each side and fulfilled that prophecy that he would be counted among the wicked. And that he would have uh, his burial with the rich and that he would rise from the dead. That prophecy in Isaiah 53 is so clearly referring to Christ and how he takes our sins upon himself and is counted among the wicked, and then is buried. I mean, Joseph of Arimathea's uh, tomb is the one that he used. He didn't have his own tomb. He borrowed a rich man's tomb. And he rose from that tomb. That so clearly referenced Jesus Christ and his passion, that in the year 85, the rabbis meeting at the city of Jamnia prohibited that passage from being read anymore 
in the synagogue lectionary cycle. And they said, we don't want to read this anymore, lest people think of the Christians. They didn't use the word Christian, of course, they used uh, another word, menim, that you know, means apostates. Hmm. So the early Christians were citing it, and the Pharisee rabbis feared that passage. So they prohibited its use in the synagogue. Wow. So there's a lot to know about Isaiah. So the suffering servant is one aspect, these four songs of the servant. Um, yeah, and Jesus himself, you know, talking about the synagogue, he quotes, doesn't he, from, from the passage of Isaiah, you know, the Lord has anointed me, has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor. So, so Jesus knew the prophet Isaiah too, right? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, one of the things we see is that passage is what he quotes. He picks up and reads from the scroll of Isaiah. He obviously knew how to read and write. And he reads that passage from the uh, prophet Isaiah. And there's something that I try to point out in the commentary about it. That is a section, uh, uh, if I, if you don't mind me digressing a little bit about how I structured my commentary. Sure, please do that, yes. Because yeah. uh, if folks will notice, I don't put it in the order of the chapters, but I put it in historical sequence so that uh, and it's not always absolutely precise day month and year like you can do with ezekiel but it is you know the the uh, years and, and period uh, of composition isaiah was a prophet who lived in the 8th century bc he began prophesying just a couple of years after the founding of the city of Rome. Just to give you perspective, wow. Rome, the so called eternal city, 8th century BC, Iron Age, this is nothing. Jericho is an old city at 11 or 12,000 years old. <laughs> but it be then as it may, uh, he begins around 750. And continues prophesying right until just about the year 700, possibly the 690s. And that gives a good 50-year period of prophesying. He had disciples. He mentions his disciples in chapter 8. What most of us in, in scholarly world believe is that those disciples formed an ongoing school that preserved the, the scroll of Isaiah and passed it on and copied it. But at certain points in history, they added to it anonymously, but they added to it. So, for instance, we see parts of the Book of Kings, Second Kings, that mentions L uh, um, different events from the life of Isaiah that gets put in. Uh, at chapters uh, 37 to, uh, to 39. And then we see, uh, 36 to 39. And then we see that there is a section from chapter 40 to 55 that is written as King Cyrus the Great of Persia is conquering Babylon before he conquered them. And this would be right around 540. Uh, so it's a good time after, uh, almost 210 years after Isaiah began prophesying, and it's addressing a new crisis that the Jews who are in exile in Babylon need to repent and make sure that they don't lose faith in God, and he will bring them out of Babylon. But then there's another section after they've already come out, and this is Isaiah 24 to 27, what's called the Isaiah Apocalypse. Right in the 520s, there was a major civil war in the Persian Empire. 
I suspect that it reflects that and you know that how the Lord still, no matter how dangerous it is, the Lord God has all this in purpose. And it gives the first teaching about the resurrection of the dead that we find in the Old Testament. Then there is another section of Isaiah 56 to 65, known as third Isaiah or trito Isaiah. And that is composed, uh, and I'm going to be very specific here, right at or very close to the year 473. The reason I date it that year is it mentions in the passage you cited from Isaiah 60, the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor, release to prisoners, and a year of favor of the Lord. Oh. That year of favor is a reference to the Israelite Jubilee year. Every 50 years they had a Jubilee. The Jubilee years were always in the 73rd and 23rd year of each century. So the first Jubilee after the Jewish people rebuilt their temple, which they did between 520 and 515, the first Jubilee is 473. And I put this passage at that point. And one of the other reasons I went into all that detail, the first, or excuse me, the last Jubilee year before the temple is destroyed by the Romans is the first year of Christ's public ministry. His public ministry begins in the Jubilee. And that's why he quotes that Jubilee passage. His whole public ministry is a Jubilee. Mm. This is the release of sinners from sin and preaching of good news to the poor and a year of favor. Of, and the word favor also is the year of grace. That this year of favor and grace is exactly what Jesus Christ came to bring, but on a whole new level than was celebrated by the Old Testament celebration. And I think that's another very important thing to understand about Christ. So to understand Jesus, we really have to understand a lot of these books of the Old Testament, a lot of his sayings that come to us from the Old Testament, just understanding Jesus in relationship then to, to history and to all of these sayings. So, so that's the value of your commentary here is you're really helping us to see that and to understand that and to really come to a greater knowledge of scripture. And, you know, one of the things we do in the spiritual life, you and I are familiar with this spiritual practice called Lexio Divina, uh, the holy reading of scripture and meditating. A lot of times that's how homilies are born uh, is through our own prayerful reading, our Lexio. And I think a lot of times when we think of Lexio Divina, we think of the Gospels, we think of the sayings of Jesus and, you know, just what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have given us. And it's a lot, it's pretty easy to, to do Lexio with the Gospels. But yeah. I'm thinking that you could do Lexio with Isaiah, but is that harder to do? Or how could a person pray with the pray through i guess uh the prophet isaiah now your commentary is really nice because you really spell it out you know here's isaiah 43 1 to 7 and then you give little reflections almost verse by verse uh in many instances and so you really could help someone through that lexio process but how could someone do a prayer around some of the texts they might read in isaiah's uh gospel of the old testament yeah, I I actually wrote that uh, as the fruit of my own Lectio Divina on the book. I I wrote the whole thing uh, in the, my chapel before the Blessed Sacrament and brought that in there to contemplate this. And, and as well as, of course, using other scholars and scholarship at times. But 
you can go in there. I try to give the historical context for a certain passage and the structure of the passage so that you can break it down into smaller bites. I like to think of Lectio Divina, that kind of contemplating of a couple of verses at a time. I like to compare that to eating a really fine quality Belgian chocolate. <laughs> you don't just grab a handful and pop them down. The flavors are so wonderful, so rich, and the chocolate so well crafted that you want to take one and hold it in your mouth and savor it, not just bite through and swallow. See, because these flavors are truly well done. Well, the same thing with these small chunks of the passages. And when you, you read through it and a certain thing strikes you, you know, that something just sort of jumps off the page to you. I like to consider that the Holy Spirit using yellow highlighter in my mind and in my heart, that this is the passage or the part of the passage I want you to focus on today and to look at that because the primary word of God does not come from visionaries and locutionaries. The primary official word of God comes to us from sacred scripture. And so we need to listen to God speak to us in the text of the scripture and savor it. And you might not say, well, I, I didn't get any big message, but I felt great peace about this. Fine. That's all you have to worry about. God's present to you and speaking that. He's using that to form your heart. Let him do so. That would be uh, you know, some of the things. And you know, I'll never forget, um, years ago, uh, I witnessed a friend murdered. Oh, no. In reading Isaiah, where he said, I have given peoples for you. And, you know, even though you go through the water and all these dangers, I'm with you. That comes alive. And you can also go to other parts of Isaiah. There are sections where Isaiah speaks about problems that we have today. When he says, you princes of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, that he is, he's not talking about their sexual issues. He's talking about the corruption among the politicians. And for us to hear that and say, is this something that is relevant to our time? And how do I deal with that? In Isaiah 5, when he talks about people who drink bowls of wine when they wake up in the morning and they drink on through the night. In a culture like ours that is loaded with drug abuse and alcoholism, that's destroying lives. We have 100,000 plus people dying from fentanyl poisoning since the border has been opened up. And to understand, you know, we have to make a choice to listen to that and hear. This is a call from, for us to not allow the use of drugs and alcohol to drown our pain, but rather to encounter God. This, you know, when when he said also in Isaiah 5 that, um, you know, I planted a good grape, how did it come up as stinky grapes? You know, that, you know, when we look at culture, the, you know, the Lord planted a Christian culture. You know, uh, this this country and all of Western Europe has its cultural roots in the development of the faith. And how is it that we get the stink that is coming from our culture as people reject the faith? What do we do with that? How do we respond? And what do we do to, to get back to the Lord so he doesn't uproot the vineyard? 
These are the kinds of things that we can reflect on. Hmm. Yeah, it, obviously the scriptures do uh, provide a consolation and difficult moments as you shared in your own experience, how the words of Isaiah could help in that type of a situation. And the word of God is living and effective. It pierces more surely than a two-edged sword, as the letter to the Hebrews says. And and so the word of God is still speaking to us today. Isaiah wrote these words before the time of Christ. And here we are, you know, 20 uh, or 2,000 years after the time of Jesus. And uh, he he himself who knew the words of Isaiah and we're hearing them and we're still reflecting on them and they still have power. And so it really shows us how the words of the prophets and the words of the gospel writers or St. Paul, how, how they really transcend time and speak anew to each generation. And Isaiah is one of the four major prophets. And then there are 12 minor prophets. Obviously, you've given us a, a great crash course, a study on Isaiah in your commentary on the book of Isaiah. If someone was to look at another prophet, which one would you recommend that they would turn to? Obviously, I think some people would immediately think of Jonah because we know the story of Jonah and the whale or whatever, the big, large yeah. fish. Um, but but of the other prophets what's in who's another like, one whose writings we should appreciate that's easy for me jeremiah hands down jeremiah is um a, 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 an amazing character uh he begins his prophesying in uh the year 627 that's why he's um addressed as a young man not a, you know, or he says, I'm just a, a young man and not a teenager, perhaps. Uh, he was about the same age as the king of Judah. And the, the problem had been that the political leaders in the 15 years before that had sided with the Assyrian government. And they were wearing Assyrian clothes and and were setting up idols for the Assyrian gods. And the question would was in the year 627, whether or not the new king, Josiah, would go with the Lord or with the policies that were for Assyria. And Jeremiah, as a young man, comes up and speaks for the Lord, and in fact, seems to have helped sway King Josiah to choose the Lord. Josiah became one of the very few kings that actually pleased the Lord. Uh, David, Solomon, and uh, Jehoshaphat, and Josiah, really about four. And uh, that he was key for that. But then Josiah died tragically in 609. By the way, the year that that happened was also the year the Babylonians defeated the Assyrians. Mm. And But the, the problem became when, when Josiah died, his sons were fools and weak. And Jeremiah is living through this chaos caused by sons who, one of them sides with the Egyptians, one other one goes against them and sides with the Babylonians, then changes his mind and goes with the Egyptians, then changes his mind again. And finally, the Babylonians said, that's it, you're done. And he destroyed Jerusalem. Jeremiah had warned them that they would be destroyed. He knew it ahead of time. And in, three, in 587, they were. But then he also preaches that there'll be a restoration. When they sinned and were just recalcitrant, he said to the people of Judah, the covenant with you is over. And by the way, Ezekiel said the same thing. And so the covenant was broken, it's done. But he then, right after the exile, when the Babylonians defeat Judah and destroy the temple, he says in chapter 31, I will make 
a new covenant with Israel. So what's interesting, especially with Jeremiah, is that nobody in the Old Testament says, well, we're renewing the covenant now. Nobody had that authority. The first time we see that there is a new covenant mentioned is at the Last Supper. When Jesus says, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. Studying Isaiah, but also studying his struggles in that period of chaos from 609 to 687. To take a look at how he struggled, he got angry with the Lord. Lord told him not to get married, and he and he didn't. And he has all these terrible struggles, um, you know, uh, with people trying to kill him, his own relatives, the priests in the temple, the other prophets. Everybody's trying, you know, it's just awful, and he's kind of by himself, but he stay, and he doesn't like working for God, but he stays faithful anyway. This is a great prophet to read. There's so much in the scriptures that uh, really, if we come to know and read them and appreciate them, uh, truly, uh, the, they can change our lives. And knowing the story Absolutely. of Jeremiah and the call of Isaiah, even how he receives the scroll and all of this, you know, the ember, mm -hmm. um, all of these things like great images that really can stay with us and, and really change our minds maybe and how we live our lives. And that, that, that was the role of the prophet to call people back to God. So you've written commentary on the book of Isaiah. It's a very beautiful book from Tan Books. Uh, it's a hardcover. It uh, has a beautiful image of the angel uh, with that ember of fire uh, going to the lips of Isaiah. And yes. so highly recommend this book to people. Now, uh, some people might have listened today and they're like, I've learned a lot. Father Mitch is very smart. He's brilliant. Uh, but should I read this book? Like, can ordinary people study the Bible? Uh, I think that's a question maybe somebody might have after listening to everything you've just shared. But I think they can learn something, obviously, from this book. But can ordinary people study the Word of God? You know, I don't know if I had mentioned this when you were at the network, but one of the themes of my work on TV is to bring the hay down so the goats can get it. In other words, I think what I do best is translate scholaries into normal English. Put it there so you don't have to have a doctorate. I got the doctorate, I learned the languages, and I try to lay out what they say. But you don't have to have all that to read it. I wanted it to be understandable to the average Catholic so that every Catholic can be able to understand the Bible more clearly. That's been one of the calls of the Vatican Council, that they want the Bible to be better known by people, both hearing it in the liturgy and studying it. And that would be my goal. So yeah, I would say, yes, they could understand it. And I think that's kind of, you know, a Catholic question, you know, can ordinary people study the Bible? Because we know a lot of our Protestant brothers and sisters, they have such a great knowledge, a great love for the word. They've studied the word. They do Bible studies. And I think your commentary is really the right Bible study for a person right now uh, to immerse themselves in a text of the Old Testament and uh, really come to appreciate everything that the prophet Isaiah said so long ago. So people can pick up a book from Tan Books, from EWTN Religious Catalog, from all the different places Catholic books are sold. And uh, if people want to learn more about you, Father Mitch, I don't know. Do you have a website or should they just tune into EWTN? No. Where do you refer people? No. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just started a YouTube channel. Um, I, which I'm going to use to post videos that I filmed in the Holy Land. 
I'm getting some guys to edit that, those videos and post them there. And I want that particularly for uh, prison ministries. I'm, I'm, I, I want the inmates to be able to have access to this stuff. That there's a prison channel that's being developed, and wow. they want they want Catholic programs. They, they give the inmates uh, tablets, but the uh, warden can very important that um, that the yeah you have to have control of it. But they want Catholic programming. And I worked with a, uh, some of my hunting buddies uh, started this Colby Prison Ministry. They're a bunch of Texas ranchers, you know, they, they raise cattle and all that stuff. And uh, one, uh, yeah, just doing a bunch of cattle ranchers. And they uh, go into the prisons and it's remarkable. Their retreats are super powerful so that you have um, it, like in the first prison they went to, in one year, 132 inmates became Catholic. Wow. And uh, the, it was so impressive to the archbishop. He personally came to do the confirmations. Wow. You know, God, God bless him. You know, uh, Archbishop Gustavo. And so, um, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, we they're now doing in 90 different prisons and all over Texas. And their goal is to turn the prisons into monasteries. Hmm. And uh, I, as a matter of fact, the last two years, I did my Christmas specials in the prisons. So that's why I want to have some of this material available for the inmates. Well, that's wonderful. And so uh, people can check you out on YouTube. And you mentioned videos from the Holy Land. And uh, maybe I'll just close with this. Uh, when I was a young kid, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago now, uh, one of the things I remember growing up is like 6.30 a.m. Central Time, the rosary from the Holy Land, you praying the rosary. And uh, it, one of the most impressionable images, you know, for me as a future Marian scholar was you at the, you know, Dormition Abbey, you know, Mary there laid out, you know, in that little monument in the basement of Dormition Abbey. Like that was an yeah. image that was just like ingrained in my mind and memory as a lover of Our Lady. So so your content has been impacting people for decades, including myself, leading me eventually, of course, to the priesthood and such as well. So so you had no, a role, so a part cool. in that. Oh, I'm so glad for that. I That is the piece of television I'm proudest to have done precisely because of what you just said that that you know it's the 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 television uh work that I most love because I when I hear people come to me and say well I learned how to say the rosary with you <laughs> that's really cool that's really cool yeah. and you know and then a lot of the treasures of the holy land that people People, our church is almost never, I've never seen another statue of Our Lady laid out in death. You know, and, and that one in particular, have you, have you been there? Yes, yeah, a few times. And you can see how the face is ivory mm -hmm. and the rest of it is carved wood, beautifully worked. Uh, it's a German Benedictines uh, are in, have the custody of that abbey. And I'm sure they got a, a few Bavarian uh, wood carvers to, to do that because it is just stunning, stunningly beautiful, like uh, you know, you'd expect from the Bavarian wood carvers. Well, that's wonderful work that you've been doing all throughout uh, your priesthood, Father. And I'm grateful uh, for you chatting with me today, sharing your great wisdom and insight into the prophet Isaiah. I know this book is going to impact my preaching. You know, on a Sunday when Great I God. see Isaiah, I'm going to pull this off the shelf and I'm going to be like, what did Father Mitch have to say about these verses that we hear <laughs> at Sunday Mass? So so you're going to be impacting my preaching now, I want you to know. So, well, so thanks so much for writing this. My pleasure. May God bless you and your preaching, as well as the people that hear you. Well, thank you very much, Father. And thanks for uh, joining me today on this podcast. Hey, everybody, it's Father Edward. And uh, be sure to check out his book. Thanks so much, Father. 
You're welcome. If you liked today's episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're listening. And don't forget to stay up to date with what Father Edward is doing by following him on Facebook, X, or Instagram at the handle at FR Edward Looney. Thanks for listening, and please join Father Edward again next time for another inspiring conversation.